I got my class excited about writing! Hi guys, welcome back to Talk and Chalk. I'm Beck. Thank you so much for joining me today. I know you're going to see straight away that this is a much longer video than I normally do, but I'm so excited. I don't even care. So I'm going to get straight into it. Writing. Seriously, I've got so many ruck, blah, blah, blah. I've got so many reluctant writers in my class this year. I have a year two class, which means I've got seven year old students. Some were six at the beginning of the year and they just didn't want to write. Great readers, very good at decoding, love getting into books. They've always got their faces in books, but just did not want to write. So I had to find a way to really engage them in writing. And the way that I did that, please don't turn off, is Dungeons and Dragons. <coughs> okay, yeah, I'm a nerd. I already told you that before. So you've seen that in my previous videos that every Friday night I play Dungeons and Dragons. And this has only been happening for a year and a half now. A friend of mine plays and encouraged me to join and I kind of got a little bit addicted. So I'm still a newbie to the game. If you've never played the game before, you'd probably be picturing 40 year old guys in a basement playing a board game. Or if you know technology has advanced now, we play on the computer, which it really isn't. We know that now. We know gaming is part of the future of education. It's an awesome way to learn. There's so many wonderful features to it. Critical thinking, problem solving, creative, uh, being creative. I'm so excited I can't even talk. So I decided after playing it for a while that I thought it would be a really good way to get kids engaged in writing because ultimately Dungeons and Dragons is telling a story. We have wonderful character bases. There's races, there's classes, there's levels, there's weapons, there's spells. There's so many things in there that kids love. It's called Dungeons and Dragons for crying out loud. Kids loved just hearing the name. They loved hearing me say, I play Dungeons and Dragons. My character is an elf. She has a bow and arrow and she fires it off and kills orcs and goblins and things. And they loved hearing about it. So I sat down with the man who controls the game that I play. He's essentially the narrator of that game, which in the game is called a Dungeon Master. Yes, it Sounds a little s &M if you haven't played it before, but it's really not. Um, he just controls the game. So he controls the story arc and the, the players that I play with. And I play with a group of, I think there's seven or eight of us that play. And Friday night we get together and I get on the laptop and I open up um, a program that's called Roll20. And it's not like a normal game. Uh, if you've ever played, you know, Call of Duty or Modern Warfare or Sonic or Mario or anything like that, where you actually see the characters moving around. It's essentially a map with just a little 2D feature on the screen. So it's like you would be playing it in person on a board game. So I started watching um, videos by Matt Colville and when I tweet this, I will be tagging him in it. I hope he watches to see how wonderful these kids have really engaged with writing just because of D&D. &D. And his videos have really helped me sort of get a better understanding of how I can control the story as the DM, as the narrator, as we would say, or as the author, as we would say in the classroom, and how I can control the scenario. And essentially, I could tie any kind of writing into this. I can write a recipe when we write a spell. Um, we can create a debate and use persuasive writing when we're talking about, you know, what's better, an orc or an elf, and get into it those ways. And I lead into other writing lessons doing that. So this wasn't my full writing program. And this was done back in term two. It was a bit of an experiment. So it was kind of on top of everything else. Um, and, and we did it sort of at the end of the day and at different times. And they loved it so much. They wanted more of it. They were asking me, are we going to do D&D today? And for those of you who, who have never played, essentially the story is controlled by rolling a die, 20 sided die. And that's a very simplistic form of how it's played. And obviously I couldn't go into detail with how it's played with these kids because they're seven and there's so many layers to the game that, like I said, I still haven't learnt at all. I still ask the dopey questions to my team and I'm very grateful that they, um, I think take pity on me and answer me as we're playing the game. So Anyway, I'm jumping all over the place at the moment because I'm too excited. So I hope you're still with me at the moment because seriously, anyone can do this. Even if you don't know how to play Dungeons and Dragons, all I did was I took the elements of um, chance and probability from the game and then I used inspiration from the game like yeah, character styles and classes and fantasy fiction and 
um, descriptions and that sort of a thing. And I just planted it into it. And by giving it, giving it that overarching title of we're playing Dungeons and Dragons, they're playing a game. They, they knew that they were going to be playing a game. So we were leading up to my DM, which is John, visiting the class on the last day of term as a reward for the class. So he was going to come and run like a little mini session with the class. And that whole terms worth of, you know, every now and then doing these activities built up to them loving it so much that I'm going to do it fully in term four. And already they've started designing characters and creating ideas for their backstories. And just in the conversations that I had with them in the last couple of days of term about what we're going to do in term four, they're so into it. They were on Google Classroom. They were jumping on Google Docs. They were on um, looking for pictures already and they were talking about the depth of their characters. And ultimately what I wanted out of this was I wanted them to love writing. I wanted them to really develop a deep understanding that their characters don't just occur for one story, that they have a backstory, they have a future, they have friends, they have connections with each other. They can make new connections. And then we brought the dice element into it anytime they had to make a particular kind of decision, which is what happens when you play Dungeons and Dragons. If there's a particular decision that you want to make, if you say, I don't know, you want to punch someone in the face, you know, the DM might ask you to roll the dice for a particular thing. And whether it's, you know, zero to 20 or whatever on there, that will determine how successful you are in it. So I, I went on a very simple scale. I said, you know, zero is no, 20 is yes. And then you've got a scale of in between. And that put in our maths language of likely and unlikely and possible and all those sorts of things. So if the student was having a hard time, um, you know, making a decision about their writing or what their character was going to do, I'd say roll a die. And they'd sit there with dice on their tables all the time. They just pick it up, roll it. And they went 18. He gets to do it. They'd roll a two. Ah, oh, it didn't work. I'll write down it didn't work. Describe how it didn't work. Make it part of the story and then make the character choose something else to do. They went so far with it. They love it so much. So if you bear with me, I'm going to take you through the activities that I did across the term with them leading up to um, a sort of a big final, it was a game. It was a game and they had to use lots of problem solving and teamwork and talking and everything to get through it. And I apologize if this video is just going all over the place and sounding very, very schmozzled, but I'm so excited about it and I can't wait to keep doing it next term and I will be coming back with a video. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch to video that I took in the classroom because I displayed everything up to show you and um, I've got their stories and everything to show you uh, how it went through. And if anyone ever wants to replicate this, I haven't written it as a formal unit yet. I'm doing that now that I know that it worked and they love it. So um, if you ever want it, I am very happy to talk, uh, have a chat online, whatever. Check all my buttons below if you want to follow me there. And I'm going to flip to the other video now. Okay, so in my classroom now, I've got all the different things that the kids did in the class, as well as the final challenge that they had before actually having an interactive session with a DM. So I'm just going to take the camera over to the screen to show you what we we're doing. Okay, so the first thing I did was I pulled up Roll20, which is the online system that I play Dungeons and Dragons in, and I just showed them what it looks like when I play to show them that it wasn't a game, you know, like a, um, a Mario or Assassin's Creed or something where you're in there and moving the character around. It's it's like a tabletop game. You have a map. These are all the different places here. So you can zoom in and see. And I'll say to them, you know, we traveled here and then we went along the pathway up here and we had to go down the river and battle some orcs or whatever. Um, and that you can move across and do different things. And I showed them where my character was from um, on the map and where she had traveled to and the different things, you know, that she did and, and how we traveled up here up to Cabacac and we, you know, battled some dark elves and that sort of a thing. Um, and I show them the details of her character and the fact that she has a story. She has a backstory. Um, she's someone whose parents were killed and she went off into the world on her own and all those sorts of things. And there's a description of her. You know, your pointed ears made it clear that your human father wasn't your birth parent, but your mother never spoke of how you came to be. Um, you know, those, those things in there. So then I go into the character sheet and I show them all of her skills and this I guess as adults, we look at that and we go, oh my God, that's so confusing. But kids just go, whoa, look at all the, you know, points and everything that's in there. And I say, you know, these are their skills and this is her level and, 
these are the things that she can do. And now my character um, has spells. So I can go in here and say, look, these are her spells. This is what she can do. And this really, really appealed to the kids because they love gaming. And this, you know, the technical side of it, having it on the screen is a connection that they can make. Um, and this just sort of shows her attributes and abilities and, you know, rolling points and that sort of a thing. And this is the part that we went to. So I had to obviously make this a lot more simplified for what they were doing. But I wanted, I wanted to give them an idea of what I do and how I connect to it and just to really build up an idea of gameplay and how I put myself into the game. So, you know, this is my character. That's oh, You can't really see it there. She's down there in the corner. Kika Beltane is her. Um, and I can change her picture anytime. Her character sheet um, stays with that same picture though. And I say, you know, she's got a bow and arrow and she's a skilled fighter and um, she's a good friend and all those attributes that she has to go with it. Okay, I'll just take you back to what they did. Okay, so the whole point of this though was to get them engaged in writing and get them to understand that characters have backstories, that the story that we read isn't necessarily the whole story. There's different perspective, different point of view. And I really wanted them to get engaged with a character basis. So the first thing that we talked about was if they wanted to play the game, they had to have a character. Now, because they were new to this, because they're little, what I did was I got them to get into groups and they made a group character. So they had to work together to decide what they wanted to do. And we talked about different types of characters that are in the, this fantasy game and fantasy characters that they knew. So they had to make text connections to be able to do this. And they know orcs, fairies, wizards, goblins, those sorts of things. So they then had to brainstorm. Sorry, I'm just getting their sheet, what their character would be what the character name would be, what their attributes would be, if they would have certain clothes or weapons or skills or um, a history. So this looks very, very messy, but this is what it was meant to be. This was just meant to be them throwing ideas onto the paper. So in a group, they did this. That was one group. Keep in mind, this was year two back in term two. So these were some of these ideas. Some brainstorming on this one. And then this one's really cool. This was the wizard. I love this character. And this group was the first group to decide that they wanted um, a familiar, a, a, like a pet animal. So these guys had a pet owl that could communicate. So this already was one group taking the ideas that we had and stretching beyond it. Um, and that was a good role model to have in the class for thinking differently, thinking outside of what we normally do when we're writing. And I love the fact that they've made those connections. So from there, they then had to work together to figure out their skill set. And this is when we got to start rolling the die. And so we get the 20-sided die and they had to roll four skill sets that were, and we kept it really, really succinct. So we said only thinking, sneaking, fighting, and talking. So out of those four things, that's where those skills were. And they had to roll to see what their top skill was down to their bottom skill and how those points would help weigh into an actual gameplay scenario. So from there, after they'd figured all of that out, they then had to figure out a backstory for the character. This is where we got writing. They still think they're playing Dungeons and Dragons when actually we're writing a narrative. So then they started drafting their story. So we worked on the, the beginning part of the story, the chunk of the story, and then um, how it would end. And so we had these folded up like that um, as a bit of a visual reminder that when you lead into a story, you know, there's a big bulk of things that are going on here and this should be lots of different events that could happen. And I like using the um, climax mountain. So, you know, arcs of the story and the big thing that happens and then little things that happen at the end. So that was where one group started. Some nice writing there. And you can already see they were more engaged in their writing. There was so much more on there than what was written before. Another story, and they continued on the back. And that was the middle part of the story on the back there. This was another one that we started with. Beautiful writing. And then another group that were writing. And you can see some groups needed a bit more scaffolding than, than others, but that's teaching. So from there, they then typed it up as a group. So they got to go onto the computer, take turns with different sentences. Someone was a reader, someone was a typer, someone was an editor, someone would um, you know, pick the font and do that sort of a thing. So they had their different skill sets going into it. And these were only in groups of four students, maximum four, more than that. And then you've got people loafing about not doing anything with the group. After they typed it up, they saved it 
and I went in using OneNote and I drew directly onto it. And if you watch my video um, where I review the Surface Pro, you can see how I actually do that onto the screen, writing onto the screen. So I wrote on there and gave them um, some feedback and then we sat down together, went through the feedback and then they went away and edited it straight onto the computer. So that was one lot of editing. That was another one. Oh, that was the one that they had, sorry. And then here is another one where it's an orange, so I don't know if you can see that very well, some editing that's on there as well. So we sat together, edited, and then I read it out loud and I didn't say anything. They would pick up when there was a mistake because I would read it as it was written. So if something was spelled incorrectly, I would read it as it was spelled and they would see that there was a mistake there. And then we went on to Google together and they got to pick um, pictures that went with their story. So um, when they did their character sheets, they ended up choosing pictures from Google to go with their characters. So this was Serpent Elm, this was Rickstar, this was Lucinda who had the talking owl. Now, obviously these aren't their artwork, they found them on Google. So um, I have no idea who belongs to these artworks. If these are yours, please comment below so we can acknowledge your work. That one, I'm missing one of them at the moment, but I can show you them on the screen what they look like. But then they turned it into a hero story. This was their backstory. So they ended up picking a font, picking a color to go with their character, and then picking pictures that they thought matched their story. So they were really cool stories. I was really happy with the language features, with their spelling, with their editing, with their teamwork, and really thinking deeply about the characters. I love this, this bard. Bard was a great word for them to learn because they had no idea what that word was. And now they use it in other contexts, which is really good. Now, oops, here's Serpent Thelm. And I love, I love Serpent Thelm's story because they didn't just give Serpent Thelm an or hero origin story. They gave his weapon an origin story. So in the beginning of this story, he doesn't start out with this mallet. He starts out with something else. I think it's a sword. Um, I can't find it. I tried to stab him. It was a sword. So I tried to stab him, but his scales were too strong and my sword broke and I had to find a weapon. And then I found a mallet in the ground. The handle was sticking up out of the dirt. I pulled it out of the ground and I ran back to the town to destroy the dragon. I hit the dragon in the face with the mallet. <laughs> I love it. Um, so, and then the town decided that he would be able to keep this mallet and that's now his weapon. So I love the fact that they're thinking before the story even started. So most kids just go, there's the beginning, there's the middle, there's the end. These guys are going, that character has a whole lifespan of different events that are happening and we can account for those in the story and they can become parts of their other stories. So then this was the whole group together as a party. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the, the camera back over here so I can show you what their um, character skill sets ended up being. All right, I'll just close up Triple Kingdom. I might just close the internet altogether. Okay, so here's what their character sheets ended up looking like. So they've got all of their details here about their character, their name, how old she is, what class she is, what race she is, uh, what tool. Uh, or weapon that she has, her traits, I love these. She's quiet, she's a joker, and her hero origin story is she killed a dragon. And this is like the briefest of orientations to their story, but I like the idea that they need to give some kind of really brief synopsis about why is she a hero. Now, after rolling, uh, these are the skill sets that she ended up with. So obviously her best skill is talking, then sneaking, then fighting, then thinking. And then they had to decide on an inventory that she could carry around with her. I wanted to give the idea that these um, heroes were adventurers, they travel a lot, they can't carry exuberant amounts of weapons with them. So they got uh, one, two, three, four, five slots, so to speak, in their bag that they could put things in. So they picked out of a set list that I gave them. I gave them about 30 different items that they could possibly carry on an adventure and they had to discuss as a group what their character would likely carry based on their attributes, based on their skills and based on what she might need if she was out and traveling. So Laura Deand had a small sack, a magnifying glass, a small knife, three food rations and a bedroll. So Lucinda 
There's her details there. She's 38. She's a wizard. She's a human. She has a magical stick and a familiar. She's smart, magical reads. And her hero origin story is that she saved a town. Those are her skills. And in her inventory, she's got a small tent, small snacks, a magnifying glass, a blanket, and three food portions. Serpent Thelm. A giant mallet. <laughs> his hero origin story is that he killed a beast. Beast, And in his inventory, he's got a climber's kit, a bedroll, a blanket, a bell, and three food portions. I'm really proud of the decisions they made to have in their inventory because they weren't random things like potions. Um, you know, they really thought about, well, if we're out and traveling, we might need to camp out. Okay. And Rick Star, who is our last one, uh, is a ninja. Uh, he's quiet and friendly and he saved a town from dragons. And in his inventory, he has a small hammer, a small sack, a water skin, a tent and three food portions. So they really thought about the fact that they would need to eat. Okay. I'm going to close that. Okay. So that all sounds really quick, but this went over a series of weeks. This kind of went over all of term two. So, and it wasn't my main writing focus. This was something that was to enhance what we were doing in the classroom and something for a bit of engagement and fun. I didn't know how it was going to go down. So I had to be prepared to cut ties if it just wasn't working. Luckily, they were super engaged. Every day they were asking me, are we going to do Dungeons and Dragons today? We hadn't even played anything at this point. We were just writing. This was how engaged they were with writing without even realizing it. So it was getting towards the end of the term and we knew that John, our dungeon master, my lovely friend, was going to come for the last day of term to take them through an interactive experience. So to prepare them for that, I wanted to run a bit of a practice session with them. And I have never been a dungeon master before or ran that, but it's a narrative. I can tell a story, not a problem. Now, because I've got young ones, I wanted to make sure that it was hands-on, it was engaging, and that there was something to break up the story as we went through and to make sure that they were working as a team together. Keep in mind, four kids are controlling one character, so they always had to talk before making a decision about what the character would do. So on this day, I decided that I would play a character as well as being um, the, the narrator of the story, the dungeon master. So I created a character, which was... Valdemar Falcone, which I have since been told sounds like a mob boss. So I'll have to rethink my names in the future. Um, but Valdemar is 48. He's a fighter. He's human. He has a sword and shield. He's serious, strong and loyal. And he saved the king. So uh, in his inventory, he has water skin, flint, small knife, three food rations and a bedroll. Um, and those were his skill sets. And I did roll for those. So in this, I had the kids all out and ready. And I had all my resources ready for the day to go. And I knew this would take possibly about an hour. So we did it in the afternoon um, so that it wouldn't detract from literacy or numeracy for the day. And I knew we were going to make a mess doing it. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip back to the other camera again to show you what we did and just how exciting it was to do. Okay, so... The first thing that happened was I told the students that there was a knock at their door, they're at home, and they received this special invitation. I had these printed and rolled up into little scrolls for them to open up. And, uh, you know, my kids know that they take turns when we do group activities, so they each took a turn. So I had the name on there, um, especially for each one. So there was Laura Deans, there was Ricksters. Um, and I kind of crinkled it up a bit to make it look old. And it told them that they're invited to demonstrate their skills at a special event. The Adventurers Guild needs new members and is holding a rare event to see who can be a true adventurer. If you want to try out, you need to find a hidden door located at the building on the map. If you find the door, you must knock three times, then clap four times, then knock again three times. And really there was nothing specific about why to do that. It was just to try and get them engaged and moving and, and having a bit of fun. Okay, so the map that they had to look at was this and um, the circle there was where they had to go. So um, this was not a long part of the story. This was just to engage them in maps. And the next time that we do this, we're going to get really detailed with our map reading. So um, I, I told them where they were and how they had to get there and told them it was, you know, approximately 30 minutes for them to get there. They didn't actually get up and travel or anything like that. This is all narrative. So this is building up to those main events like we do with our normal stories. So that was that one. Okay. When they get there, they had to find the secret door and I told them, so I'm just going to, I believe it was this one, uh, here. So I showed them this picture and I said, when you arrive, this is what the temple looks like. And um, we've got a temple very similar to this at our school. So this, you know, made a bit of a connection with the kids. And I said to them, you know, what do you do? 
And this is where the kids could start to talk and someone would say, oh, our character wants to go up the stairs and look for the door. Someone said, I want to go and check if it's below the columns here or if it's hidden somewhere. And luckily I didn't have to guide anyone. Someone said, I want to go around the side here, around the back there and have a look. And I went, okay, your character does that. Um, and I asked them to roll the die to see if they were successful or not. And luckily they rolled a 19. So I said, uh, yes, you get around the side there and this is what you see. I said, can you see the secret door? And I thought it was pretty obvious and it took them a good while. They came up to the screen here and actually stood here around the screen. And then one kid went, ah, oh, I can see it here. And I went, yeah, well done, okay. What do you need to do? And then this is when um, one group sort of looked a bit worried and then uh, one of the girls looked back at their note and said, oh, we need to do the clappy stampy thing. So one did it and I said, the door opens for you when you enter. I didn't let them all enter though. I then slammed the door shut. The other three hadn't done it yet. So then the other three went, oh, we've got to do the clappy stampy thing as well. They did it and I let them through the doors. When they go in, that's when they meet Valdemar Falcone, my character here, who gives them a big spiel about, you know, what they need to do to be a hero and a champion and what they've got to demonstrate and um, what they need to do. So uh, he said that, you, that you'll be working for the king if you're part of this group. You need to go through the hallway and figure out uh, which door leads to the puzzle room. So then... Um, sorry, I'll just switch over to it. Uh, where's puzzle room, puzzle room. So this is the hallway. I describe what the hallway looks like. It's a bit disheveled. It's hard to tell where all the doors are. And then you come to these doors. And where are the doors? There are four doors. And he tells them that only one door is the correct door to the puzzle room. And that if you go through the wrong door, you automatically fail and you all need to pick the one door. So this is now when the class has to get all, all together and decide as a group which door they want to go through. And I love this because the kids got all got out of their chairs and came to the board to inspect these. They were so detailed and they were talking about the different um, door handles and how these ones here were the same and how this one here kind of looked like a puzzle on the front. And then one kid um, stood up and went, hang on a second, this is the only door that has um, like sort of green mold on it and it's the only door that doesn't have a handle. All of them have a handle except for this one. I think this is the puzzle room. And then they had a big conversation about why it could be or why it wouldn't be. I didn't direct them at all. This was just them having a conversation for about five minutes um, on what to do. And then he said, okay, let's vote. Who thinks we should go through this door? And they all decided they would. Now, teacher hat on, oh, I don't really care which door they go through. I just wanted them to justify which door they were going to go through. If they justified that this is the puzzle room because it looks like a puzzle, I would have said yes. Um, you know, the whole point of this activity wasn't to necessarily pick the right door. It's just to work together and have conversations and justify why they're going through that door. And I kind of like their reasoning being that because this is the only one that doesn't have a handle. I would have let them go through any door. I don't care. <laughs> okay. So once they were in there, they then got given um, a puzzle. And the puzzles that I gave them were, they looked like this. They all had different ones and it's it's just a letter thing. So, you know, F goes there, L goes there, O goes there because it's the letter that starts with that. Um, w goes there, E goes there, R goes there to make flower. The, word, the picture is even there. So once they figured that out, they had to write it down and give it back to me and um, they had a few of these. So if I go, I wonder if I click over if it'll show it. Yep, so there's, there's a few more other ones there. I had a bunch of these printed out. And then it gets to the point where it gets harder and the picture isn't there. They've got to figure out, you know, L, A, P, and just go through. So um, just a bit of writing to go with it, a bit of teamwork to figure that out and, and go from there. Okay, the next thing that they had to do was to go outside. Uh, so um, Valdemar came out and said, wonderful, you're all such great puzzle people, whatever. Um, <laughs> come out to our training area now. And this was when, 
I'll just show you a picture of the party there. This was when they had to go out to the training area and um, build. So they were told that they needed to make a shelter. So just switching the camera quickly because I don't have a picture of what they did here. So this was more the STEM activity. So I had like a cardboard and styrofoam and paddle pop sticks and matchsticks and blue tack and sticky tape and everything imaginable are pulled out from the storeroom and they were told they had to build a shelter for their character and I had little cardboard cutouts of their characters about this high that could stand up and they were given 15 minutes to build a shelter for their character and it didn't have to have tables and chairs or anything like that it was just there's a storm coming imagine there's a storm coming and you need to protect your character how are you going to build something so this was great they got hands-on they were problem solving they got to build something they were measuring uh, they were fixing and if it fell down they fixed again and um, I did take some photos of those if I can find them on my camera I'll slip them in to this part of the video to show you what their little um, shelters look like and they were meant to be makeshift shelters it wasn't meant to be anything special But they really liked this part and they got into it and they were talking about their character and how their character would build it or what they would use. They really, really made it about the character and not about themselves, which is what I want them to do. I want them to get into that mindset of, you know, thinking like their character. So that went down really well. And then the next thing that they had to do was get into a battle. Okay, so Valdemar then came out and um, said that he had a box uh, covered with a sheet and um, this is what was revealed. Uh, I told them there were two though, there were two goblins in there and they were only little, they weren't gonna kill them or anything like that. He said, "The your challenge is that you need to get the goblins back into the cage. You cannot kill them, you cannot harm them, um, but um, you need to be able to work together to get them back into the cage. And then he opened up the gate and walked away. <laughs> so this was when the kids then were able to tell me what they wanted to do using their skills. And this worked so well. I'm flipping again because I don't have photos or anything for this one. So kind of to make it short, because this went on for about maybe 10 to 15 minutes, this battle, the kids all talked about what they would do. You know, one was talking about trying to capture it with rope and another one was talking about pushing it back into the cage. Um, the bard said that they would play their guitar in like a sleepy way to try and make the goblin go to sleep and they rolled a 20. So that was awesome. I could say, yes, he starts to drowse off to sleep and he just falls asleep on the ground. What do you do? And then it went to the next person. The next person said they were going to roll them back into the cage. Um, and as we went around, um, they had different ideas. And, and one said, oh, the other one's still running around. I want to try and trip him over. And they rolled like a one. So I made it that they tripped over themselves instead. And they were laughing and getting into it. And they really understood that concept of you know, zero to 20, what would be effective, what would be ineffective. And we were talking about chance and probability and effectiveness and what would happen there. So they went around the group and and eventually they got the both goblins back into the cage they were very successful and they were cheering like mad when they got them in there and that's when um valdemar came back out and congratulated them and said they were true champions and then they got a certificate so i printed out uh, a certificate for each student in their character's name. So this was Lucinda's group. They all got one of these each on a bit of card. Um, this this was just something I made in Word. Um, I found a random picture that says Adventurers Guild and slapped that on there, probably copyright issues, but I don't care because the kids loved it. And I signed it from Valdemar Falcone. And now the kids have been inducted into the Adventurers Guild um, awaiting instructions from the king. Okay, so I'll finish up here in the classroom and I'll probably go back home and debrief on things that I've probably missed. But um, the next step that I'm going to be doing now that we're going into term four, because the kids have been asking for more and more of this, is to take them to the next level and they're going to be using their own characters. So I'm going to be controlling 18 characters, which I've got ideas on, um, but they've started some character planning already. And I mean, look at the difference in their character planning to what we had before with all of those um, those crazy messy pages. They're really being strategic now 
on their ideas on you know what they're going to do with their characters this time they're really thinking explicitly about it and thinking uh, you know further than what they did before but i'll leave it there because i'm sure i've missed some things so um tonight when i go home and edit i'll add some video to the end okay so if you're still with me i hope you enjoyed seeing what they did I know the kids really love it. It's really hard to sort of um, express in a video like this when it's just me talking and, and kind of rambling and jumping back and forth on what they did, but they really, really loved it. And they, they have gone from being those reluctant writers at the beginning of the year to wanting to sit down and mind map. They want to sit down and put their ideas on paper. They understand that the pencil in their hand is not a barrier anymore. It's it's a tool, it's a weapon, it's something that they can fight and battle and cast and travel and journey and do all sorts of wonderful things with. So I really look forward to continuing this next term with them and doing it more in depth. I'm a little bit scared of letting them all have a character each and me controlling 18 characters. And if Matt Colville is still watching to the end, don't think you will, but <laughs> if you're still watching to the end, don't worry. I have a plan on how I'm going to control 18 characters and my lovely DM, John, who I hope is also waiting till the end of the episode to finish watching, he will help me as well. So I'm very, very excited about that. And now I have to debrief myself because I'm very excited. Okay. So if you haven't done it yet, click on the subscribe button. Um, follow me on Twitter or Pinterest or Facebook below again. I, I don't spam or anything like that. This is just me sharing my ideas and experiences with other teachers. Hopefully you liked it. I'll put my button down below so that you can hover over that if you would like to click on subscribe. And I'll put up one of my other videos at the top there for you to click on. So I look forward to seeing you in some of the other videos. Comment if you've got any suggestions or if you want me to contact you at all, I always do. Thanks, guys. Bye.